Hello everyone, this will be a reading from uh, the book The Mystical Marriage, uh, a reflection on St. Maximus the Confessor's 400 chapters on love. Uh, this is a work by Elder Emilianos of Simon Fetara, uh, who wrote this on the, Holy, on the Holy Mountain on Mount Athos in the 1970s. These actually came from a talk that he gave on St. Maximus the Confessor's works on love. So I'm going to read into, um, I'm going to read the preamble first, and then I'm going to read the chapter on love from St. Maximus the Confessor, and then the elder's response or reflection on that chapter on love. Here's the preamble, which was likely written by Maximus Constus, who is the head of the seminary of the College of the Holy Cross in Boston, which is an Orthodox, Greek Orthodox seminary. Here's the preamble. All of St. Maximus the Confessor's chapters on love are inspired by and reflect the everyday life of a man in the mystical nuptial union of God and the soul. These chapters are, in other words, expressions of nuptial experiences. We can say that, that the legitimacy of our love for God is not unlike the legitimacy and fidelity characteristics of marriage. This means that a person who genuinely loves God does not divorce himself from God. He does not introduce a third person or party into that relationship that would compromise the fidelity of his soul union to God. So the book is set up, just so you can see, the book is set up for uh, the red is the written chapter on love by Maximus, and then uh, the elder's reflection is underneath. I'll link the book title uh, on from Amazon on the description. Chapter one. He who genuinely loves God prays entirely without distraction, and he who prays entirely without distraction loves God genuinely. But he whose mind is fixed on any worldly thing does not pray without distraction, and consequently, he does not love God. Now, um, this is a little rough for modern ears to hear, and um, you know, kind of as we go through this, you know, you'll kind of get what the confessor is saying a little bit, um, and it's it's not as rough as it sounds. You know, we we kind of tend to take this language so literal, and I, and I think there's a reason too with St. Maximus the Confessor, but um, I'm going to read that again, and uh, just, just so you get it, and then I'll, I'll read the elder's reflection afterwards. He who genuinely loves God prays entirely without distraction, and he who prays entirely without distraction loves God genuinely. But he whose mind is fixed on any worldly thing and does not pray without distraction, consequently, consequently, he does not love God. Because St. Maximus understands love to be a conjugal union with God, he cannot imagine that love for God exists in a person who cannot pray without distractions. The absolute necessary condition for the spiritual life is an undistracted mind because union with God takes place principally through the mind. When someone says, I'm distracted by thoughts during prayer, or I can't concentrate during prayer, or I'm cold or indifferent and don't feel anything during prayer, you can be sure that such a person does not love God genuinely and has never loved him. We often say that we love God and sing praises of his love, but we're not able to pray without distractions. If this is the case, it means we're not speaking truthfully, that our praises are empty because genuinely, genuine love for God is generative cause of undistracted prayer, and undistracted prayer is the genuine cause for the love of God. Would you like to have a practical standard of measurement to see if you love God? Pay attention and observe whether or not you can pray without distraction. See, in other words, if when you pray without distraction, if you, I'm sorry, I'm going to start over. See, in other words, if when you pray, your mind is distracted and cut into pieces by desires, thoughts, passions, or by any other foreign element that is not spiritual or immaterial. If there is something that is able to divide our mind and cut it into pieces, this means that we do not love God. For the love of God is like a strong surrounding wall that protects us and prevents anything from outside entering in our inner spiritual world. 
Otherwise, it is like I have a saw and use it to cut up a piece of wood, and in doing so, the pieces fly in different directions. Something similar happens to the mind when it is torn into pieces by thoughts and passions, by the various inclinations of the heart, by desires, and anything else like this. Does your mind pray without distraction? Does it remain untouched, unwounded, inviolate from every thought, activity, inclination, fantasy, and passion? If this is the case, then how can you be sure that you love God? Undistracted prayer is a simple way of knowing whether or not you love God, and it also means for loving God. And it is also a means for loving God. Now, we hear that uh, first part of the prayer, or first part of the chapter on love. I always want to call those chapters on love prayers, um, but they're reflections. And again, they're reflections on nuptial unions or almost a marriage covenant between us and God. And the confessor kind of lays out that if you can't or you, and, and again, this was, this talk was given to monks. Um, this talk was given to monks, um, but it, it also just applies to everyday people. Um, so when he says, you know, the, the elder is going to talk through the, what the confessor means, that if our mind is attached to something else, some worldly thing, um, then that's the cause for the distraction that we have during prayer. And so what he's telling you is when you are praying or if you are praying and your mind is distracted or goes into something else, you know instantly that that's a material thing that your mind is bound to, that you have a passion for. And um, it sounds rough that if you've done that, you've never loved God. Um, but you understand that that it's it's when he, when he says that he's you know he's just offering that it's a genuine love and and that should make sense to us like that should make sense to all of us. So uh, next thing that the elder does is is now he kind of breaks up. So that was a full reflection over kind of the whole of the chapter on love, and now he's going to break it up into smaller sections, and we're going to go over some of those. So this is a part over the section that is written. He who genuinely loves God prays entirely without distraction. So this is going to be about praying without distraction. And I believe, yeah, we'll, we'll keep going. Okay, this is, this is he who genuinely loves God prays entirely without distraction. There can be no doubt that you're fooling yourself if you think you love God when your mind is filled with distractions. What does it mean to genuinely love God? From what verb does the adverb genuinely come from? From the verb to be, which means to come into being and to be born. It means that I am born naturally, that I am the son or daughter by nature, the son or daughter of my father and mother. I am not an illegitimate child. I am not born out of wedlock from someone who is not my mother or father. Thus, the one who, gen who loves God genuinely is the one who naturally and truly loves God. And whatever such a person creates, whatever he gives birth to, comes forth from a legitimate and lawful union. From this, it follows that every thought, every desire, every impulse of self-will, every memory that divides and fragments me is an illegitimate offspring. It is neither from God nor from my spirit, which is conjoined and united to God. This means that the, distract, the distraction of my mind is adultery. One could say that it's like having a strange woman in your mind who would rival God for your affections. It would be, in other words, an idol. And this is why scripture says idolatry is adultery and calls our thoughts idols, that is, our reasons, opinions, ideas, motivations, and incentives. Moreover, when the Israelites fall into idolatry, falling victim into their thoughts and their reasonings, scripture says that the sons of Israel committed fornication. Here's a simple example of what I mean. As I am praying, I feel within myself an impulse, the movement of a passion prompting me to act on it. This points to an act of adultery that has taken place in the depths of my being due to the passions of anger, desire, consistent with whatever was stirred up, um, stirred up the impulse. 
On the other hand, the person who prays without distraction does not engage in adulterous couplings in his thoughts, but lives together faithfully with God. And whatever he creates, whatever he brings birth to, comes naturally and truly from God. From this, it follows that the natural movement of the mind is a movement toward God, for this is the mind's natural activity and function, namely as to ascend to the Father. In this way, the words, he who genuinely loves God from the confessor, refer to the things of the mind, that is, I love God genuinely when my mind genuinely ascends to God. Whoever genuinely loves God and truly moves together with God, truly walks together with God, truly sees and is seen by God and is raised up together with him. But whoever is distracted in his mind during the time of prayer has already committed adultery in his heart, and he is in love with whatever has entered his mind and separated him from God. Now that again, that, I, I understand how difficult that sounds, but it's practical, and it's it's practical in the sense that as you are praying or as you're in your reflection time, um, as you're in your time of solace, if your mind is going somewhere else, if your mind is move, moving into to a different place or to something material, it lets you know that your love for that thing. You know, is separating you from undistracted prayer, which gen generates love for God, according to St. Maximus the Confessor. So that is part one of our, our or that's a section from chapter one. That's all we'll, we'll do and reflect on today. Um, I hope, I hope uh, your kind of quarantine section uh, is, is going okay and, and that you are finding things to do. Um, hopefully I'll be able to upload a video again tomorrow. Thank you.